statement is our prayer request. Pray. Pray in my hat. Whitney Lively.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you this evening. First of all, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your many blessings. But most of all, we thank you for your son Jesus and for your promises of salvation, Lord. I ask and pray that you would please, uh, Lord, forgive me, Lord, and tell you for just continuing to do so, at least I speak for myself, Lord. And I just, uh, again, thank you for being good to me when I don't deserve it. I pray and ask as we meet together this evening, Lord, that you would be in the midst, that you would be the name of God, Father, that you would help us all to understand a little bit more about your plans, Father, and uh, help us, Lord, to get out there to be a good witness and to be effective for you, Lord, to share the good news of your son, Jesus. Father, there's been many things that's been mentioned that need your attention, and I'm confident there's things that were not mentioned forgotten and unspoken, Lord. I just ask and pray that you would please continue to be the good and great God that you are, that you'd watch over us, take care of us, Lord, that you'd continue to provide our needs and be a blessed Father, and that, Lord, most of all, you'd answer prayers. So we bring these things before you this evening, and I ask and pray that you would be in the midst, you would lead, guide, and direct. And, Father, may we live in need this evening, that you would answer that. In the precious and sweet name of your Son, Jesus, we thank you and bless you. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 9 tonight. If you want to turn to Revelation chapter 9 uh, and hold that place there, uh, you should have also picked up a, I want to call it a question sheet, a sheet that you keep notes on. Uh, there's about 11 different questions listed there. Uh, that, that you can sort of keep them, uh, keep up with and, and take notes for. But uh, there on the back, back there is the uh, Revelation chapter 9, there's actually, it, I'm actually splitting it up into two different groups. The first group will be the, the fifth uh, trumpet that we're going to hear, or the fifth trumpet. The second will be uh, the sixth. We'll deal with that next week, or well, actually not next week, but sometime after Thanksgiving, we'll deal with that one. But as we're looking at these uh, these different things that are being unleashed, these different uh, horns that are being sounded, trumpets that are being sounded, one of the things that we need to remember is this: that when we when we read this, some of these things may not make any sense to you right now of what it's describing. And guess what? It wouldn't to me or anybody else because we've not seen these things yet. These things that are going to be unleashed to us at, at this point in time in Scripture, we've never seen any of these. These things are designed, created, and meant for a specific purpose. And they've been held through all eternity for this time period. And so I don't want you to get caught up in how we're reading and trying to I mean, certainly you're going to try and imagine uh, this creature that I'm getting ready to describe for you here in a little bit. You're going to try and put that in your mind and say, now how is that? What does it look like? How does it work? And, and, and then you may even sit there and say, you know what? That may be like this or that. And, and I don't want you to get so wrapped up in that that you forget the real message. And the real message is this, that God has sent judgment. And when we read these things, there is a purpose and a meaning for everything. And in particular, the, the creature that we're talking about that has been created for this moment tonight, we're going to be looking at where it comes from and what its mission is. And that's what we need to get tonight when we leave here. We need to take that with us. You may have other thoughts. You may have other ideas. You may have other uh, things that you learn. But we certainly want to learn those two things. All right, God? 
We know that you sent it. Now, why did you send it, and what did you accomplish with it? So let's look together. Revelation chapter 9. We're going to begin reading with verse 1. The Bible says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Who wants to take a guess at who the star is? Anybody? He falls from heaven and he's given the keys to the bottomless pit. Who is this star? Satan. And we know this because we see other scriptures that tie into that, both in the Old and New Testament, that talk about uh, Satan, the star falling. And we know in Daniel that, uh, that there's a prophecy about all this. And, and so we, we see that in other passages and other scriptures. This, we're literally talking about Satan at this point. I saw a star fall from heaven, and he was given the keys to the bottomless pit. We're talking about the devil. And in verse 2 it says, And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So, picture if you will, he opens the pit, and what comes out? Smoke as it came from a fiery furnace, right? Here's his smoke, and it just comes out. I mean, it just starts darkening. It, it just keeps flowing and comes out. And in verse 3, we read something. We read where it says, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth unto them, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Uh, First off, let's go back to the bottomless pit. What is the bottomless pit or the abyss? What is it? No, not, not hell, but it's where certain things are held. That's where the beings are being held. No, on earth, you think, we well, you know how thick the earth is. And the bottomless pit, there's no way that there would actually be a bottomless pit. It's not on earth because the ship driven will go all the way to the other side. Bottomless pit. If you go so far in it, you keep going, gravity will take over and pull you right back to it again and back again and back again. And it's endless. It's an right. endless pit that is held specifically for demons. Remember when uh, Jesus was going to cast the, the demons out and, and they said, don't, don't throw us into the abyss? That is the bottomless pit. Don't, don't do that. Don't, don't put me in the abyss. Let me keep wandering around. Right. The abyss is literally where the, where the bottomless pit is open. And now all of a sudden the demons come out. And in this, now we see the third element, which are these uh, locusts. And we're going to uh, talk about the locusts a little bit because that's really the direction of, of what God's doing in this, in this particular uh, part of this, uh, this trumpet sound. But that's exactly right. And I, I'll, I'll ask you a question. I'll pose a question. If I dr drilled a hole from here to China all the way through and then dropped something into that hole, where would it go? You ever thought about that? There was a hole from here to China, the other side of the world, straight through it, and I dropped something in that hole where would it go? It would just keep moving back. It would be a back and forth instant. It, it, would, it would get speed falling from here downward, right? Until it hit the other side of gravity where gravity was then working again and it'd pull it back and it'd just be doing this number like uh, back and forth, back and forth. That's the bottomless pit and, and I, I wanted to touch on that and you hit it so well. That was a perfect illustration of gravity basically affecting it from both sides if you will. It, it, it literally goes through one side back to the other. But a good illustration of that is if you drill through the earth and you got to the center of the earth, that back and forth movement will, would be continuous. All right, let's go on. By the way, um, what actually comes out of the smoke that we just said? What did we say it was? All right, what do locusts do? They eat what? All the crops, all the food. All right. um, have you ever held one? They do spit on you, but have you held them? You, 
played with them all that. Uh, we used to catch them all the time and then uh, chase my sister with them. We thought that was a pretty cool thing to do. But, but I want you to think about it. They don't harm you, do they? But they eat plants. That's the nature of a locust as we know it, right? Follow along with this. Verse, verse 4. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. Does that sound normal? That's different. Then the other part is, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. Doesn't hurt grass, what it normally does. But it does hurt men, which is what it normally doesn't do. You have a complete flip on this particular uh, locust in its character and in its nature, which is one of the reasons why we know that it is a, a specific thing set aside for this specific event. What's interesting, Johnny, is if I was around at that time, now God's taken me out of here, but if I was around at that time, I could play with it. You see that? Look with me again what it says. It says that it's to go around and hurt men which has not had the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, how God does that seal, I can't answer that, but, uh, but we know that when you're sitting there in this day and age, and God has placed his seal upon your forehead, and you're sitting there, you can literally pick this thing up and play with it, and it's not attacking you, but it's attacking everybody else that does not have that seal. I want you to know, and, and I've learned this uh, from, from Brother Eddie, that God's about giving chances even now. And if I saw a person that had a seal on their forehead, basically that said, I'm a, I'm a Christian, don't mess with me, I'm, I'm bad. No, that kind of If I saw a Christian pick up one of these things and play with it and just enjoy having it around and they weren't getting bit, or they weren't getting stung, and they were doing well, and then I'm over here getting eat up with this thing, shouldn't that encourage me then to do something? Try and get that seal, right? I find it amazing that God's love is still being shown on the fifth trumpet in the book of Revelation in chapter 9. Think about the love of God that he would continue to give you a chance and even show you an illustration. Guys, if you want to suffer, you're going to do it because you're lost. These people that are saved, they're not suffering. I hope that, that our generation and our folks and children and all, I hope we are teaching them in such a way that they see that to where they don't have to go through suffering. But literally, these people are suffering, and they're still those folks in this in this passage of scripture, there are still those folks that reject the love of God in their life. Now, there could be any number of reasons for that, none of which make any sense to me, but they continue to reject God. Before we get to where we judge them too much, though, are there times that we reject? You know, it's easy to stand in judgment when we read scripture about people in the future, but don't we all at times re refuse or reject God's will for our lives? Well, we call it sin, right? Uh, the time that I don't do what God asks me to do, the time that I don't pick up the phone and call a friend and tell them, hey, you know, I, we're having church Sunday, we'd love for you to come to church, or the time that I don't send that little card of encouragement just because one of my brothers or sisters uh, are in need and I know that they could just use a, a word of encouragement. Don't we sometimes fail God and reject God's call into our life? God wants us to do those things and gives us illustrations to know how to do. And even now in the book of Revelation, verse uh, chapter 9, he's still telling them by example, if you're going to live without me, it's going to be a terrible, terrible life. But if you want life eternal, life abundant, you need to be a Christian and you need to get saved. Let's keep on reading. 
And then in verse uh, 6 it says, And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from him. Now here's the, the, the locusts. This is what I wanted to get to. And the shapes of the locusts were like the horses prepared in the battle. And on their heads were as it were crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions. And there were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. Now, we went through quite a bit, and I want us to go back and ask, what, how do these creatures appear? Well, I, and just sort of give a quick description of what, what we read here. How do they appear? What, what, what do they take the image of? Well, of, of a horse, a human face, but a, a horse-type feature, feature of the body. They have crowns on their head, hair like women. Um, the, the faces were as faces of men, hair was as women. Their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And then they had tails like of the scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. I mean, you've got a mix of, of things here that are hard for me to grasp. You got a horse, you got a man, you got a woman's hair, you got teeth like lines, you got breastplates like an iron breastplate. I mean, there's a lot of things going on in this description, and they're called locusts. When I read this passage of scripture, I got wrapped up in that. Do you all sometimes get wrapped up in what that looks like? But you know what I missed because I was so busy trying to figure out what they looked like? I forgot to see that their mission was only five months long. Why do you think that may be? And I'm going to hold off on you answering it because we talked about it last Wednesday. Why do you think it was for five months. If you want to tell the lifespan of uh, a locust, five months. The lifespan of the locust is five months. And their, their mission was for five months to go and do these things. Its whole entire existence. <laughs> God has created all of these things and has laid them out. And while you and I may not understand all the details and all the things that are going on, God has set this as a plan that is going to come about and it's going to happen. And everything has its time, everything has its place, and everything has its purpose. And so for five months, this thing goes around and it's Bites and it's and it's doing all those things, causing hurt to men. And you think, man, that's awful, right? Well, guess what? That's fantastic. Because for five months, God is still trying to show people. He's still trying to be patient. He's still trying to, to encourage people to turn from their wicked ways, to get away from all that's going on with this evil, to turn to a righteous and loving God. Five months. He gives people five more months. People want to die here. Can't even die. He gives them five full months to repent. You know, the people, they trying to kill themselves. They'll take drugs, shoot bullets right through their head. They want to kill them. This is, we go through natural events, and that's what we understand. And you're saying, Naturally, it's going to kill you. 
feel it. Five months of fear going on, usually a night, I jump out there, jump right back there to keep swapping over. I, I made fun I, and, and joked around with, with a buddy of mine at work. We were talking about uh, if the walking dead, is that what it is? The, I, I don't even remember what all it was about, but he, he was telling me something that he was watching, and I told him, I said, You know, you're laughing about. You know how real and how true that all would play out. You know, you, you, you think about that. Uh, somebody was saying, I, what do they call them when, when they're dead but they're not dead? What do they call them? Zombies. The, the zombies. The zombie, the zombie thing. You know, the, the funny thing is that people uh, have joked about zombies that have throughout all, that, all the time, right? But there's going to be really a day where some just doesn't die. And it's here. For five months, nobody's going to die. Now, to me, I, I can't grab hold of that, John. It just won't. In my mind, I can't get a hold of it. But God tells me that's exactly what's going to happen. Now, to be fair, I can't imagine somebody coming back from the dead either. But guess who did? Jesus. Not only did Jesus come back from the dead, but he also had several other folks that he gave life to to come back to life as an example. And here in this day, we're going to see that all of this unfold in a miraculous way. It's things we've not seen before. It's, it's events that are going to play out that we would never, never fathom before. And yet all of it is designed to keep buying time, to keep putting on, to keep giving that one other soul, that one other chance to come to Jesus. Let's go on and finish out the rest of this passage. And verse 11 says, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two more hereafter. Um, just to ask real quick, the, the, name, of the, the name of this uh, this king, the, uh, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is a bat, but also a poly. Uh, if you've ever read the Left Behind series, that name shows up a lot. You'll see that name Apollyon in that book. It's pretty neat to read that if you get a chance to read it. But, uh, that's their king. These people or these uh, locusts that come out here, they're not like any other locust because they also have a king. They're not like any other locust because they bite man and they sting man. They're not like any other locust. They don't even mess with, with green stuff. It's all about torturing men and tormenting men. And the person that is their king is named Apollo. Um, When, when you read a passage of scripture like this, there's something else that I want you to grab, and that is the woes. You know, here we're told one woe has been given, that's this woe, but there's two more coming. One woe has been presented, but you still got two more to go. If I made that statement to you, and you had already gone through all of this, Again, I'm going to ask a simple question. Why wouldn't you repent? Who was not hurt during this five-month period? Who did the locusts not go after? If I saw that, wouldn't that be the answer to me? To, I need to get saved. Wouldn't that be the logical answer? And to make it worse, now I'm being told, not only have you gone through one woe, I'm thinking, oh man, I made it. Now I'm being told that there's two more to come. Why would I want to go through those other two? I've got a question I'm just racking my brain. All right. So I thought that their hearts were already hardened to the point where they couldn't be changed. Therefore, the room just didn't change. But now, is that true? No. 
Their heart is not hard to this point. No. I, I, as far as I've read, I continue to see, as I continue to read, there are still people getting saved. There are still people taking the seal. There are still, still people that are turning to God. I don't know if some of that is because there's younger people that are growing up. I don't know if that's because they're just people that, for whatever reason, have missed the system of the mark of the beast and are, are now taking on the, the mark of God. I don't know. Do what? That's still 144,000 preachers preaching. Mm -hmm. And those two men that testified. The so whole time? They're still performing miracles. People try to kill them, and the fire comes out of their mouth and kills them. That's going to be, that's going to be on Fox News now. <laughs> I guarantee you, if you ain't watching the NPD, you're not watching the right news. But <laughs> hey, it's going to be on ABC because that's how it didn't happen. They'll, they'll lie to you too. The whole world was like, hey, Abaddon was the man. He's been got these locusts under underway. Don't listen to them preachers. And they're going to send people out and be trying to kill them, be rewarded for you and everything else. They'll be hiding under rocks and buildings. And, uh, you're going to find me there because I see you under one of the biggest caves in the land if I can find one. But this is still all supernatural stuff. It is. I would say this, just remember everything that you're reading from this point forward is a whole different world. It's no longer a world that is in order of, of just normality. This is chaos. Now, there's an order to this chaos, and it's God's order. But for you and me, we would see it as chaos because it would just be... Things are, are happening here that have never happened before. Things are going on that you've never witnessed or even thought could happen anymore. Um, who would think that I could shoot Johnny and Johnny would still leave? You know, none of these things are playing out the way you would think these things should play out. Um, and your question as, as far as getting saved, I believe I believe that there's probably still a great revival still yet to come even in the next couple of verses or next couple of chapters. That angel is still going around and around the earth. You, you still have the proclamation of the gospel. You still have the 144,000 evangelists. You still have those that have been converted and are now sealed with the seal of God. And all of that has to do something. It has to change some people. The problem is, I believe, Johnny, that, that there are people that have hardened their hearts, and it's getting worse instead of better. God's still being gracious. God's still trying to reach people, even in the midst of all this. But again, people have got to word now the bit. Why, why, why is Johnny so special? Why does he have that on him, that on his forehead, and they won't bite him? And they won't, uh, what makes Johnny so special? And so rather than getting right, I'm willing to say, I'm better than John. And I'm going to try and defend my own self that time. And so you're seeing the hardening of the heart. And all of this, when we get to the end, you're going to see all of this is done for the whole purpose of me revealing my evil, or man, revealing our evil, and, and God still trying to turn that evil into good. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, but there's a first thing I said. What is this? Well, in, in that third year or three and a half years, go back a little bit, it said that there was a multitude, literally there were more people than you could count were saved during that one period of time. And so that so, was the end. I caught those who didn't write. Mm -hmm. No, so they're on earth. Strictly the converted. The converted from there. And, and that's an exciting thing to know. But look what the deal is. You know, again, it goes back to, to what we were saying earlier. Why would you go through this if you just get saved now? You know, somebody said, well, why don't I just wait till then? First off, you may be one of the 25% of the world that perishes before that happens. And the other could be, 
just to be quite frank, if you're waiting, you may die of a heart attack. You may die of a car accident. You may die in any number of different ways and never make it to this particular thing. Uh, and so the idea of waiting is foolish. The idea to get saved is not, uh, not to wait and put it off. Um, but yeah, uh, there'll be people that are saved even after even after the rapture. Yes. And go back and read uh, from chapter five on, and you'll see those well, numbers of people that. I thought the whole point of the judgment was to take us to a point where hey, I'm going to show them. We're not at judgment yet. Well, what are these woes and stuff? These are woes to men. Uh, there's judgment coming, but all of this is. Really, what I said earlier, God is actually trying to show you in every different way possible. So this is have nothing to do with the judgment at this point. Well, no, it's it's. I mean, it's because judging the world God. even as we go, but it's not the judgment that you're thinking of, which is the judgment of the judgment from. Well, I thought because of the tears or the prayers of all them at the altar, and then finally he said they offered us the sweet smell. He goes, okay, I'm gonna boom, and then they start going. The 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 saints' prayers or the saints' the saints' all prayers all going up have been answered. Right. Um, that's a yes. The I, I want to say the, the tribulation has begun. Now this period of the next three and a half years, God is is doing a lot of things, and just like He did. In Pharaoh and Egypt. Remember, Pharaoh sat there and God continued to tell him, let my people go. If you don't, this will happen. He could have at any time said, all right, you get to go. And those things wouldn't have happened. But what happened? He hardened his heart. And every time it was God still saying, you have to let my people go. If not, I'm going to show you my power. I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to show you my ability to persecute you as you have persecuted even my son. Um, but I, I, as far as I can tell, that, that will be the answer. Yes, is that people are still being saved even in this tribulation. Absolutely. Anyone, anyone have anything they want to add or say? Or? Anyone if not, um, let me say this one last thing. The one woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. God has sort of given us a, a sense of that even today. What, what has God told us is going to happen today? That times will get worse, right? That things will start moving in that direction. And if we look around, we can certainly see that that's the case. That Sin is becoming predominantly approved. Uh, that people are just, oh yeah, that, that, that's not uh, a taboo thing to talk about anymore. Um, I would have never have dreamed some of the things that are on TV today would have been there in 1970 or 1980 when I was growing up as a kid. I just, I can't imagine all of those. And, and things have progressed so fast. And uh, the, the other thing is this, the speed at which you now know stuff. I mean, if something happened in England, we probably could know about it in in less than two seconds. You probably would be able to get something to pop up on your phone, a notification to say, hey, check out what just happened, and you'd know about it literally like that. And when when that starts progressing, obviously a lot of things uh, come with that. And one of those things, when we talk about the world seeing these uh, and you'll hear about this one. When we talk about the world hearing these two uh, two preachers preach, and they heard them worldwide, and they heard them in their own language, and we're like, what? How would the whole world be able to do that? If I'm sitting there and I'm putting it on the internet with my cell phone, and you have any link to me whatsoever, you're going to be watching it just as I'm watching it, just as anybody else is watching it. And with that, technology has made all these things possible. Because I'm telling you, in 1980, that didn't make sense to me. I'm like, well, everybody has a TV. Well, 
No, everybody carries a key thing. You know, it's in their pocket. It, it, it is just amazing what has happened in, in that short span of time. And, and I believe all those things are leading towards this. Now, again, there's a lot of people that say, well, we've been doing this for 2,000 plus years and Jesus ain't come back yet. And I said, well, tomorrow may be yet. You know, I don't, I wouldn't be looking at it that way. But I, I do think we need to be looking as though he's coming and looking with expectancy. With that being said, why don't we stand and dismiss with the word of prayer and um, Brother Johnny, I, I asked you earlier to pray, do you mind dismissing the also? Yeah. 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 Yeah.